Hi, thank you for joining us for the Public Narrative Podcast. I'm your host, Jamira Alexander, and I'm joined by President and CEO of the Chicago Foundation for Women, Felicia Davis. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm happy to be here. I'm fangirling right now. So, and I am because I am a byproduct or benefactor of the great work that you all do at CFW. Um, CFW has supported Public Narrative for several years. Um, but particularly, I've most recently completed the um, Willie's Warriors cohort, the yes. fourth cohort, and um, bold four. the Bold Four. And I'm, I'm a lover of programs, so the year that I applied, there were two programs I wanted to get into, and Willie's Warriors was one of them. And just to be able to connect with black women who, I mean, just profound in their industry, in their work. Um, in their passion, like it, it, it's a direct reflection of what you bring to Chicago. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And we should let everybody know that it really is steeped in social justice. It's named after Robin Willie Taplin Barrow. Mm -hmm. um, she was a short in stature, but really a giant in civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, as a black woman leader in civil rights, she felt very strongly that black women's leadership isn't always honored in yeah. spaces, and she wanted a place for. Um, she wanted a place where black women could be nurtured and supported, and that's what we've created with Willie's Warriors. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you were part of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it's been incredible. I mean, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what led you to this work? We see the results, but I know that that came through several lived experiences. So just share a little bit about your, your own uh, journey. Absolutely. Um, I'm a girl from the south side of Chicago, um, and I say that um, for a lot of reasons, because um, I grew up in public housing, I went to public school, you know, I took public mm -hmm. transportation, um, we were not a family of a lot of means, mm -hmm. and growing up on the far south side of Chicago, so um, Elka Gardens uh, public housing project that a lot of Chicagoans don't even know mm -hmm. exists, but they, and some of them don't know that the city even goes that far south. Yeah. Right. And so growing up on in the communities um, around so Roseland in and around um, uh, Algeld, you have a sense of you get a sense pretty quickly of like what's going on in the world and like the context of things. So mm -hmm. this community looks this way. But if we travel and we are driving someplace, if we're driving downtown we get on the expressway those communities look a little bit different mm -hmm. and what we now know obviously is yeah. that that the reason why those communities look different is because of investment mm -hmm. and so i think the journey to where i sit um you know at cfw i always say you can't it can't be measured in miles mm -hmm. it is it really is measured in experiences and lived experiences and those opportunity points and so my viewpoint was shaped um, by living and working and, to, you know, growing my family on the South side and seeing the differences between neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and, and today the work at CFW is about, you know, really working on some of those differences to diminish the inequities. Mm -hmm. Who's been like some of your greatest influencers? I would say my mom, first and foremost, I always say that because she just gave me an amazing example um, even though we were a poor family, she taught me the principle, um, there's an African word for it, Mbutu, mm -hmm. which is, um, we are all connected, right? Mm -hmm. I am because you are. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my mother taught me this kind of like responsibility to and for each other that is yeah. uncommon, that's not commonly taught to totally. people. But the reality is, especially in society where things continue to be, um, more, there's more and more discord around differences. The reality is we are all connected. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the systems that are at work, they're at work around all of us. Mm -hmm. And so the inequity here, um, shows up in other places Absolutely. and people don't, aren't prepared for that. They don't mm -hmm. recognize mm -hmm. that. And so, um, the job really is to make things more equitable for all. Mm -hmm. Do you recall when you came into that understanding, like, what what was that experience like? I mean, I don't know if it, there was like one single moment. I think it was kind of like a culmination of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, um, in my in my background, um, I served on the Chicago Police Department for ten years. Mm -hmm. I was a police officer, um, patrol officer, and violent crimes detective. And so, as a police officer, and I've always said this, 
in my blue unis in my blue uniform, I could go places that my black skin wasn't welcomed. Mm. And that's here in our own mm -hmm. city. And so I would have to say it was during those 10 years, um, collectively, uh, because of the specific intersections where police sit or policing sits in the community, I really um, absorbed a lot of the, you know, the finer points around just the specific ways in which black and brown communities were disinvested. Yeah. What interested you in becoming a police officer? It was, um, I mean, there are two answers. <laughs> <laughs> we got time. The, the, <laughs> I mean, the one answer, which is true, uh, both of these things are true. So the one answer is I really saw it as a way to be of service in my community. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up at a time where people were had very very favorable opinions for police officers, right? There had and at the, you know I joined the police department in 1991, and at mm -hmm. that point it had been about 20 years where Black people and women really mm -hmm. were um, given the opportunity to serve in that way. And so mm -hmm. there was a, still a lot of camaraderie in the Black community. Um, there were still police officers were still very much looked up to, you know, mm -hmm. as neighbors and 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 you know coaches and things like that. And so there was a police officer. I remember on my block. Um, as I was growing up, one of the places we lived. And I thought, you know, he seemed to just be a good example mm -hmm. of, of a person in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, as a kid, I don't have all the context and background of policing. And certainly, yeah. you know, a lot has changed in those years, right, mm -hmm. since that time. But really, that was one. So that was one of the answers. I really saw it as an opportunity to... Um, uh, contribute to the community. Mm -hmm. The other answer was, it's actually a good job. Yeah. And then, and I think a lot of people don't get that, right? One yeah. of the things about um, the department, and I, and this goes to, you know, how a lot of the middle class was created is union representation. Mm -hmm. So it is a union job. We can talk about that union later. But the point is that there is pay equity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's one of the places where I knew because um, it's very structured and so mm -hmm. there's a lot of transparency around mm -hmm. pay and so because of that you know for a lot of reasons I knew that the man who was sitting next to me and say if we were in the squad car together more or less we were making the same amount mm -hmm. of money if we had the same time on the job mm -hmm. you know length of service we were making the same amount mm -hmm. of money and to me there are a few places where women unequivocally know yes that they are making a hundred cents on the dollar mm -hmm. for what the man is is earning, mm -hmm. and so that part of it was it really it really is a good mm -hmm. um, opportunity, and and you learn a lot. There's a lot of conversation around establishing pay equity. Do you think there's much that you know that dialogue can learn from the police the policing system? Well, I I mean. The reason why it's that way is really it's around unions, right? Mm -hmm. So unions have been the pathway to the uh, middle class for a lot of people because it did decrease a lot of the discrimination, a lot of the you know discretion and oh we're going to pay this man this amount and this, but yeah. it's still it's but but still it's not fully equitable. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, I would say some of the things that in our work today that we push for are really around pay transparency. Mm -hmm. You know, the city, uh, the current mayor just announced an equity audit, or not equity audit, but a pay audit mm -hmm. every two years the city mm -hmm. will do. Mm -hmm. And that, those are the types of things sure. that will help decrease pay inequities across, mm -hmm. you know, across, this is government we're talking, right? Mm -hmm. So across city government by actually getting the numbers and then holding people accountable for mm -hmm. what those numbers say and changing them. Mm -hmm. what, what has caused you to, because for your career trajectory, it's like you get in there, you roll up your sleeves, and you bring solutions. Like, what has really oriented you in that? Um, you know, I think part of it has to do, you know, with the crazy work ethic that my mom gave me. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of it has to do with this responsibility that I do feel, even today, I tell young people when I meet them, I say, I want you to know this, that people that you know, and people that you don't know, mm -hmm. whose faces you'll never see, yeah. whose names you will never know, are fighting for you every day mm -hmm. in rooms that you may never mm -hmm. walk into. And so there's this part of me, right? I recognize that the zip code of my birth, the fact mm -hmm. that my mom was a single mother who dropped out of high school, like all of these data points mm -hmm. would say that my life was supposed to be really small. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who say, well, we don't think you're going to graduate from high right. school. We think you're going to get pregnant and drop out. Like mm -hmm. those are real things that people said yeah. to me. And so part of it is based on that. It's kind of like, you know, 
I am a, I was an underdog or I was born an underdog. Mm -hmm. And so I, part of what mm -hmm. I do every day is proving people wrong. Mm -hmm. And and now I do that, not just in the context of like a me, like a personal fleece. I do that in the context of every little girl that's growing up on the South side of Chicago, every mm -hmm. black little girl that's growing up on the South side of Chicago, I'm doing it for her mm -hmm. because those people don't know you. They don't know mm -hmm. your spirit. They don't know the talent and the mm -hmm. drive and the, they don't know what it really takes. I mean, that's the other thing that people don't understand the power and resilience that it takes to grow up in a community yes. where there's not a lot of investment sure. and we don't celebrate that type of leadership. Yes, totally. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by how you've taken your experiences and you've le leveraged them in such a way that you've held these positions of power in uh, organizations that have the opportunity to really make a significant difference for people. Like, what are some of the things, aside from the, the uh, Willie's Warriors program, but what are some of the things that Chicago Foundation for Women is involved in to help advance um, women and girls here in the city? Absolutely. Um, another initiative that I'd like to talk about um, is She Covery, mm -hmm. which is our trademark initiative. Um, so let's thinking about COVID, so I want to just give a couple steps. Going back to January of 2020, so before the pandemic really, because we get to closures um, in March. Mm -hmm. So in January 2020, uh, 2020, women had outpaced men in total workforce participation in our whole country. Mm -hmm more women in the workforce than men, mm -hmm. which was a sea change. Like that was an important yeah. moment. And it was a short lived moment because then by March, we're all in um, sheltering in place mm -hmm. and a lot of closures happen. Mm -hmm. And soon after, you know, 4 million women fall out of the workforce. I mean, mm -hmm. other people leave the workforce as well because of the closures. But the, the particular thing around women leaving the workforce is that it was very much driven to care giving mm -hmm. and the requirement of care work. And so the pandemic pushed too big Things right, it um, increased economic instability and insecurity for families, but mm -hmm. particularly for women. Mm -hmm. And it also increased the burden because in mm -hmm. our country, overwhelmingly, care work is um, provided by women. It is expected to mm -hmm. be provided by women, yeah. um, and there it's devalued a lot of times. So she covery is an effort to raise those issues. There are four pillars: getting women back to work. Um, caring for our caregivers, mm -hmm. demanding an anti-racist healthcare system, and addressing mm -hmm. the eviction crises. Mm -hmm. So she covery is an initial raising money um, specifically for that for those four pillars. Mm -hmm. But our everyday work, really, you know, in Chicago, and this was before the pandemic, three hundred thousand women every day are fighting just to put a roof over their heads, mm -hmm. to have you know the basic needs, and that's before all of the impacts of COVID. So our work is really centered around how can we change systems, how can we mm -hmm. change policies. Um, and what can we do as far as direct investment or encouraging others to make investment in the organizations that are really on the front line supporting women and girls in that in that really powerful mm -hmm. change? I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm clear on, but I think for the sake of context, it's important to make clear that while CFW focuses on issues that impact women and girls, the influence that you all have really addresses issues that impact some of everybody, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is really important. I want to, because, you know, I talk to mixed groups a lot, mm -hmm. and sometimes I feel like men, like their eyes glaze over, like, you know, <laughs> like, here we go here again. She goes with this. <laughs> Um, and what, and I, I am reminded of something uh, Isabel Wilkerson says in her book, Cast, that to some people, equity feels like a demotion, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Just like mm -hmm. we, like the state of mm -hmm. equity to some people will feel like a demotion. Mm -hmm. And that says more about those people Certainly. than it says about the cause Certainly. and the fight for equity, right? If you have to feel better because you need to be better mm -hmm. than someone or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, then that's more about the person. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the work that we do, a lot of the policy change work. So an example is working in coalition for years and advocating, you know, being part of the coalition, you know, women employed and other organizations that just um, led the state to have um, paid leave for everyone, mm -hmm. paid mm -hmm. leave for everyone. We didn't just say paid leave for women, right. right? But we understand, like, the reason why we're in this fight is that women overwhelmingly, mm -hmm. right, are carrying these burdens. Mm -hmm. 
but that paid leave for all mm -hmm. benefits everybody. Totally. So a lot of this equity work that we do, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. It does benefit um, men and women and families and different communities. There's just been research around pay equity actually helps men live longer. Hmm. So gender equity, yes. <laughs> wow. Right, it just came out this month, uh, March. It came out in March, Women's History Month. And mm -hmm. so, and that is pretty significant research yeah. because it sh it signals that what I just said earlier about how we're all connected yeah. and how these inequities yeah. are actually hurting us all. Totally. And so gender inequity is actually, if you obtain gender equity, you actually, women live longer, but men live longer too. Mm-hmm. That, you know, so it, that reminds me of, there's a woman, uh, Dr. Joy DeGru, um, she did a study on post-traumatic slave syndrome, and she, she likens that same concept to um, the impacts of slavery and the aftermath of slavery, that it still impacted everybody. Yeah. And just much of her, lec many of her lectures lend to, you know, this need for liberation and what that looks like. But as I make certain connections in my mind, it's like being able to offer um, quality care and resources to women helps to sustain the family, ultimately in helping to like kind of broaden safety and security across the board. It then spills over into a lot of societal issues that we see, you know, impacting public safety and public health and education and such. Like, are there other um, issues that you all in your work that you, you work together in coalition or in community to address? Oh, yeah. Safety is one of those issues. Um, you know, specifically for us, it's um, making sure that women are free from gender based violence. Mm -hmm. Gender-based violence shows up in a lot of ways. It shows up in street violence. Mm -hmm. um, one of the initiatives, um, when I first came to CFW, um, we started a special grant for organizations that are working in the communities where, you know, on the south and west sides of Chicago, black women were being murdered mm -hmm. and are missing. Mm -hmm. There's still a number of women yeah. whose, whose murders have, who are either missing or whose murders have gone unsolved. Mm -hmm. And trans people, a lot of trans women, but trans people mm -hmm. were also being, you know, brutalized in mm -hmm. different parts of the city. So we targeted a very specific grant to help the organizations kind of like with education, outreach, um, bring those stories forward for yeah. the survivors, and, you know, and their families, mm -hmm. um, calls to action. I mean, so there's a lot of policy work that we work on. So there's that. We push for a lot of economic um, impact things. And so one of the longer term like pie in the sky things that we hope to accomplish is to reduce the benefits cliff mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. you know that's so when someone is receiving public assistance they can only earn so much in a job before say their child care benefit decreases mm -hmm. so these are very real examples of women say you get a 25 cent an hour raise mm -hmm. or 50 cent an hour raise will turn down the raise because it will put them over the threshold mm -hmm. and they will lose say $600 a month worth mm -hmm. of childcare mm -hmm. benefits and the raise maybe would have been, mm -hmm. you know, $800 a yeah. month, but still not enough to, sure. to, to make up for the difference. Sure. Um, and so, you know, that's a uh, federal work. Um, I mean, but the city, the County and the state also, um, have skin. We try to work on childcare. Mm -hmm. Childcare is an, is, is a real challenge right now. Post COVID. Um, a lot of child care centers haven't reopened. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, child care um, professionals are women and women of color. Mm -hmm. And anytime there's, uh, uh, you know, job segregation where it's focused on women or um, women of color or even people of color, the pay for that job mm -hmm. tends to be low. Mm -hmm. It's low, again, this is education we're talking about exactly. at its heart, but it's still considered low value mm -hmm. work. Um, and so people aren't putting a premium on that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're working to make sure that that ecosystem has changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the pres President Biden, you know, took a big step when he said that um, care, childcare was essential infrastructure, which from where I sit, it absolutely mm -hmm. is. Um, 
men and women both need childcare yes. in order to participate in the workforce. Yes. But women are the ones who get held back. Yes. Um, and so we work on things like that as well. Yes. And then a whole bunch of leadership development work yeah. um, so that women leaders can shine, training women to serve on boards. Mm -hmm. Still today, too many nonprofits have boards that are all white male. Mm -hmm. um, we make sure that with the organizations we work with, their boards are diverse, their staff are diverse as mm -hmm. part of our requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, we've had organizations come to us and say, can you help us diversify our board? They mm -hmm. see that as something really important. And sure. it's and this isn't like a million dollar grant we're talking sure. about, but it really is uh, symbolic and it means something. And so sometimes organizations come back to us and say, help us figure this yeah. out. This, the work that you're leading is very much so systemic. Did you imagine like early on in, early on in your career that you'd be in this position to lead this type of transformative work? No. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe there are people out there who figure it out early. Um, and say, I'm going to do exactly this and then go, I mean, originally I was a pre-med major. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I think <laughs> part of the way I describe things, you know, I'm like, I don't know that this, my same journey would ever be replicated. Mm -hmm. Like somebody would do like 10 years here in police department mm -hmm. and go into higher education mm -hmm. and, ten, and then, you know, at city hall. I don't know that that same journey, but what I have always found is that my heart was always about working with people, working with society, and doing good. Mm -hmm. And that's what I followed. Yeah. And so I have, 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 have had these like transitions, you know, like pivots. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people are like, wait, wait, how does that make sense? <laughs> I mean, but to me, the thread throughout all of it, really, even though it's, it's not all considered public service or the public sector, mm -hmm. to me, it very much is public service because I've always had... Um, our community mm -hmm. at the front of whatever it is sure. that I was doing. Sure. You know, I, so I studied broadcasting in undergrad and then three months before graduation decided I didn't want a traditional career in journalism. I had worked at a news station and I didn't enjoy, I, I enjoyed the technical parts of journalism, but I didn't enjoy the types of stories that we had to tell. Who was shot, who was murdered, who was stabbed. And this was every day for two years. Mm -hmm. And um, three months before graduation decided I wanted to change my major, my career advisor was like, get the degree and go do whatever you want to do. And right. that's exactly what I did. So I got the, this, I have this degree in broadcast journalism, but now I'm working for Job Corps and I don't have in my mind, the technical experience that says that I'm qualified to do this, so I pursue a master's in public administration. So around 2017, I'm trying to figure out how these degrees go together, and I learn exactly how they fit when I arrive at public narrative a year later. Mm -hmm. So I do understand how sometimes you can be on this trajectory that lands you in a place that it's perfect, your experience is ideal, but you don't know that going along the way. Like what gave you the faith or the encouragement to sustain even throughout the unknown? Yeah, I, I mean, faith really, because part of my belief system, you know, I believe that uh, we all have a destiny that's like predetermined mm -hmm. and that there is work. There is an assignment for Jamira. Mm -hmm. There is an assignment for Jamira that only Jamira can do. Yes. There is an assignment for Felicia that only Felicia can do. Mm -hmm. And so every day I wake up, I always say the same thing. I ask the Lord to guide my steps. Yeah. And I have not always understood because yes. sometimes I was like, this doesn't exactly. Right. This isn't. <laughs> this isn't what I envision. But why am I over here? Mm -hmm. um, but I have always. I, but I've always been faithful to that, mm -hmm. right? And and so because of it, I've had these experiences that have been just been really, really rich mm -hmm. and fulfilling. For and sure. I wake up every day with just like a sense of purpose and energy. Mm -hmm. And that's also a sign that you're on the right, right? Absolutely. Isn't that the sign that you're it on the is, right? It really yeah. is. Yeah. I'm finding even in those moments of not understanding, sometimes that's a sign you're on the right track. I know for me, I have this notion, sometimes I can be a bit of a control freak. <laughs> When I get to the point where it's, it, I clearly see that this is all so much bigger than me and I take my hands off of it is when I can step back and see that things are truly falling into place. Yeah. And it gives me a deeper appreciation for the purpose for my life and my, my, and, and my, my own lived experiences in that even on my best day, I could not orchestrate the the scenarios 
I could not orchestrate the outcomes. You know, I would have to, as you said, like remain faithful throughout. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have that wherewithal without the uh, taking the first step, you know, and, and, and using the tools that that um, that I was even given through and by my parents and my family. Yeah. Very family oriented. And I think that that speaks to the way I show up in the work um, because I don't. People may consider me a people person, but I think it's just more so how I was raised. Um, my my grandmother um, came to Chicago in 1954 with her children, her small children, and Mississippi from right? Mississippi. Yeah, and um, in my my family's own great migration story, like the neighborhood, uh, our community became family. And in accepting that of like who our family, our extended family is, it's like you don't meet a stranger. So I, I say this like everybody I've ever met in my life was once a stranger, including my parents. Like when I got here, I didn't know them people. You know, it took some time to get to know. It took time to get to know them. It took time for them to get to know me. Season after season, you know, as we continue to age, we learn how to embrace each other in different ways. Like, how have you found as a leader that you need to preserve your own well-being, that you can embrace folks in the ways that they need um, for whatever season of life that you connect with them in? Oh, this is a really important question. I mean, and I'm and I'm and it's important because of all the things that you've just said. And you know, lest people think we're two black women mm -hmm. having this conversation who've had all of these experiences, and lest people think like, oh, everything is working as it should. I want to say, no, I've had racism and absolutely. sexism and absolutely. all of those things. Absolutely, ageism. Every, yes, uh, absolutely. And so, so part of it is, you know. It's just one of the things is just growing up in a country that discriminates against you freely. Mm -hmm. You, um, I don't want to like do this like strong black woman trope, but you sure. do, you, there's a, sometimes there's an expectation because you're prepared, I think, because, you know, my mom spent a lot of time preparing me to say, look, you know, when I was a little girl, uh, my mother said about herself, I'm fat, I'm black, and I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. And she said, that's all people see when I walk in the mm. room. And she said, you're black and you're a woman, you know, mm -hmm. girl then. But that's what people see. Mm -hmm. So your work speaks for mm -hmm. itself, right? Mm -hmm. She's like, babe, she's mm. like, you, like, you're, like, you have to, Felicia, do a good job in the work, like, mm -hmm. because that's what you do. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing was because she also knew that, there's a possibility that people don't recognize that. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily see that good work. So I have this crazy work ethic that like, I am going to really roll up my sleeves. I'm going to take this serious. I'm going to, you know, seriously, I'm going to learn whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? The All of the different pivots and transitions mm -hmm. um, because they can't ever take that away, right? Exactly. What's ever in your head, they can't take exactly. that away. And so part of that is then saying to myself, you know, knowing when to, and it's a balancing act. I mean, COVID has certainly helped. Mm -hmm knowing when to pull away, mm -hmm. knowing when to, I need to be, I need solitude. So I think people believe that I am like this natural people person. Mm -hmm. Cause when people see me, mm -hmm. it's like, right. Mm -hmm. But I need, so I'm mm -hmm. not, I have learned to be more extroverted, sure. but I also need time to sit in solitude and just not mm -hmm. talk. So that's part of that mm -hmm. care. And the other part of it is to be careful of, you know, I doubt myself a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of women of color do this. And a lot of people, imposter mm -hmm. syndrome comes up. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a girl from the projects. I'm not supposed to be at this mm -hmm. table. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. So the other piece of it really is to mind my own thoughts and my own self-talk. Totally. Um, and then to have a circle of people who know you. Mm -hmm. Because as you go through life, you collect a lot of acquaintances. Sure. But the people who really know you, who know your core, who can always remind you, yes, right, and who can always bring you back to the fact yes. that you are right where you belong, yes, you are absolutely doing yes. the right thing, yes. Those people, for me, though, they're people that I actually hear. They're I I hear what you're saying, but whether or not your words penetrate depends on the nature of the relationship. And those folks, I find so important because this this is hard, right, and. So it in our nature, it can be for us to not walk away from a challenge, mm -hmm. to roll up our sleeves, mm -hmm. to figure it out, whatever it takes. 
but there are folks who have to remind me that you don't have to have all the answers now. You don't have to know what the next step is. And that has been perhaps the greatest liberation in my own leadership in that, like my team will ask like, well, to what end? Like, what are we doing? I don't know yet. <laughs> and I am so at home in saying that because I'm looking for community to help inform it. Yeah. And that's where, you know, I, I appreciate so greatly the folks who have come into the fold and embraced public narrative, embraced, you know, PN under my leadership and even the expanse of the team because We've been around for some time, 34 years, mm -hmm. but the needs of the community has changed significantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do we pivot and how do we redirect without losing sight of our mission? Mm -hmm. And it's been community members who have helped us to do that and to, and to shape that. But the pandemic, I think, was a completely different challenge that I can't say that I was ready for. I think in year one, it was more of a, what do we need to do right now? Year two, it was, and, and when I say, what do we, I mean like public narrative and its project partners. Mm -hmm. Year two, it became a, what do we need to do as a community? Mm -hmm. And then this, this last year has been personal. What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't realize that I would experience such burnout in a way that it just felt like trying to keep things going, yeah. you know? Um, but I'm recovering from that. And I'm wondering, like, as a part of Shecovery, is there an element that addresses what that means for the individual leader or, like, a, a person just in their own humanity? So we have... Um a program it's called block we usually come up like she cover is a nice name it is block is and okay. it's beautiful branding i see it all oh, over instagram <laughs> so uh block is this uh black women's leadership um kind of like organizational capacity work that we're doing and it originally started obviously the height of pandemic people were burning out um black women are burning out at a high rate mm -hmm. because of all of the intersectional um you know, there's a double whammy. There's a series of double standards yeah. that you have to face. The organizations that are led by black women get the least amount of funding. Mm -hmm. And so if you are constantly stretched on funding, if you often black women, black leaders are called in when things are bad mm -hmm. and things need to be. So you're expected to come in, do a yeoman's job of like turning around mm -hmm. an organization. And for all of those reasons, with limited resources, sometimes limited staff, that uh, all contributes to the burnout. And mm -hmm. so what Block is doing is helping those uh, Black-led uh, organizations, those Black leaders, actually prioritize some of the things in their organizations that will, for wellness, for the entire mm -hmm. team. So whether that has been around, you know, ensuring a retirement plan, mm -hmm. where that's been around having... Um, a living wage in an organization, whether it's been around, you know, other benefits, healthcare benefits and things like that, things, those things actually sustain the entire organization and mm -hmm. those things actually contribute to efficacy of the organization. Mm -hmm. So in the nonprofit industrial complex, um, very often funders don't want to fund that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and to me, that's immoral. Mm -hmm. I mean, particularly in the context of the pandemic we've just come through, mm -hmm. where we had nonprofits whose staff had to buy their own personal protection equipment mm -hmm. because the dollars were so restricted to mm -hmm. program dollars only. And these are the very same staff who were working on the yes. front line, who then became yes. essential workers, who were, you know, working in our communities doing you know, life-saving, mm -hmm. life-changing work, mm -hmm. um, who, you know, in many instances, people didn't want to pay a $15 wage. Mm -hmm. And so to me, to say then, you know, when you look at the uh, efficacy of an organization and you judge it by how small can they make their administrative overhead, mm -hmm. what you're basically doing is asking for the employees of that organization to carry the financial burden mm -hmm. on their backs mm -hmm. and that's inequitable mm -hmm. and so through block we're trying to change that mm -hmm. you as i listen to you you have a heart for justice and it sounds like Girl, it shows up it sounds like it shows up <laughs> in whatever you do 
My mom will tell you. <laughs> it's the thing I said the most when I was a little girl. Well, that's not fair. That's not fair. Well, this isn't fair. And this isn't fair. I know she was like, what is she going to be? I was always talking about, I didn't have the word inequity. Sure. But I just, it's just like, but that's not fair. Mm-hmm. And I mean, of course, the answer is that, well, life isn't fair. But no, that's mm-hmm. not, that's not, that's not. My crusade is that every Human has unlimited potential. Unlimited potential. Mm-hmm. We put those categories on people Certainly. as a society, Certainly. and we set these barriers that say you can go this far, but you can't go this far. Mm-hmm. We do that, and so yeah, I, I there is a lot of there is a lot of justice in there. You know, little girl Felicia is walking around with her hands on her hips. And, well, that's not fair. <laughs> we need to do something about that. That that's but it's excellent though. Like to for that passion to be cultivated that young. And for it to show up and benefit so many in in this way, like, what do you imagine the future holds for you and your leadership in CFW? Well, one of the things, and I've said this before, um, and you alluded to this, our organization is 38 years, your organization is 34 years. Mm -hmm. And and these were organizations started by Mm -hmm. non-BIPOC people. Mm -hmm. And so in my case, four white uh, women founders who, Mm -hmm. who have talked about the fact that you know, wasn't as inclusive and intersectional as it should mm-hmm. have been from the very beginning. So changing these storied institutions to be more inclusive, to totally. to um, think about and to bring in all cor- you know all corners of our city in the work. So one of the things that I've said is that when I'm done with at, in my time at CFW, what I want the ideal that this is how I know we have done it. Mm-hmm. We've landed this is that. Every girl or girl identified person in the city sees themselves in our work. Mm -hmm. So because a black girl growing up in Chicago has a different experience from a Hispanic or Latina girl growing up in Chicago has a different experience, right? From a white girl growing up in Chicago or, or, or a native, you know, Mm -hmm. a native girl growing up in Chicago. So all of these girls have different experiences, Mm -hmm. just like women in the workplace right now, March 14th was equal pay day, but that was really just equal pay for women. Mm -hmm. Um, um, because their equal pay day is March 14th, but native women still make 57 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. So we're not, we're not solving for March 14th. We're trying to solve for the 57 cents. And so to me, it's, you know, again, there it is. It's like, you know, we're trying, I see this work as that, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, like really just making a, as strong of a push as I possibly can Mm -hmm. for all the reasons why, um, equity should be achieved. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm so fascinated by that. And so public narrative, formerly community media workshop, it was started by two white men and there are folks who like reference, I've only been here for a little over four years. So November will be five years. Um, but there are folks who reference the transformation that has happened under my leadership. And I can't say that it was intentional in the demographies that we support or the ethnicities that we support, but it was more so intentional around finding top talent and being certain that we were expanding our audience. At one point in time, we do programs with youth, but but youth wasn't a part of our audience. And in being able to then capture this concept of intergenerational storytelling and recognizing that there's there's something for youth to contribute to the lives of our elders and there's something for our elders to impart into the lives of our young people. I personally just feel it as an opportunity to share what I've had all my life um, from my elders and from those younger than me. But being able to capture this intergenerational experience has been one that has been near and dear to my heart. I, I, I believe that you have to have a passion project in order to stay when, the, when the, the stuff is really tough. So if I can connect with the things that I'm most passionate about, it makes it all worth it. But the thing for me, I don't know what what like the time frame looks like. The thing for me is to make certain that the things that are in place are sustainable even beyond my lifespan yes. at the organization. Yes. And I, I learned early on that that is the mark of a true leader is that it can stand even in your absence. Mm-hmm. And so just in working towards that, um, being very much so dedicated to advancing the mission and expanding its reach and, and relationships with journalists and community members, but in helping folks tell their story, no matter how uncomfortable they get in sharing their story, that they find some measure of 
uh, empathy and compassion, that there's a place for their story. And it just sounds like under your leadership at CFW, you are creating an opportunity for all women's stories to live and be cherished and to be valued and ultimately supported equitably. Yes, that's it exactly. Kudos to you. Because <laughs> that is you. no small feat. <laughs> Thank you. And But, you know, I think about it, you, you said something, like you said, I don't know if I intend it. And I, and I, I think... Um, as you were looking at the demographies that you're serving and you're looking at your own body of work. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it starts with a lived experience that just by, by, vir by virtue of that, you make different decisions. Totally. You see the choices differently. You see the questions differently. Mm -hmm. uh, you ask different questions. Mm -hmm. um, I value, like you, I, every person who um, we interview for the team, I ask them, what does it look like to bring your full self to mm -hmm. the table, right? I've been at tables at the highest level where I have said, I am the black, I'm the little black girl from the projects. Mm -hmm. And if I don't speak up on this issue, who is? Mm -hmm. Because nobody else at that table has that experience. Has that experience. That's right. Nobody, uh, half these people don't even know how to get mm -hmm. down there, right? And so, <laughs> <laughs> be lost. I, I think about that sometimes, just dropping mm -hmm. people off at different parts of the city and saying, uh -huh. no, figure, figure it, it out. out. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Maybe that's a podcast. No, <laughs> Where am I? Um, but no. And so I think it's really important then that, you know, Shirley, Shirley Chisholm said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your own folding mm -hmm. chair. And I'm saying when they give you a seat at the table, you also have to lift your Absolutely. voice. Absolutely. Because otherwise it's just like, then you're just, you know, mm -hmm. decoration. Mm -hmm. You have to raise your voice because that is the lens that is the experience that nobody else at that table has. Totally. And I, I'll just, I'll say this in closing, not only lifting our voices, but I found that being in certain spaces, I have to identify where I can contribute value. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, just as you said, like nonprofits, sometimes th those nonprofits that are led by people of color don't always have extensive budgets. Right. In looking at what other types of currency do we have? And what I have found is that we at Public Narrative, we add a value around storytelling that is more inclusive, regardless of what the industry is or the focus area, that then allows for folks to amplify what they do. Mm -hmm. And it makes it more relevant, but all through and by storytelling. And it was, I can't say that that was an, an epiphany that came to me in a dream or anything like that, but it very much so came with curiosity. And that curiosity, frankly, has just kept me stirred around advancing this work and, and being able to identify where there's value to contribute and then where there is an opportunity for us to be valued. And I can firmly say that CFW has been one of those relationships that has been reciprocal. Um, and, and I can't say that there's very many organizations or institutions across the area, but I do see you all as a leader in that. And I truly, truly pre appreciate what you've done with that organization um, in, in seeing it as an opportunity to then shift from a white lens to a, a black woman's lens and in one that then contributes to everyone and not do what folks are fearful of in that well, we're only going to cater to people of color. And right. that's not, right. that's not oh, the that intention the at all. Very first thing. I've had that. I have had people say like, oh, you only care about black people. I'm like, have you actually seen the work that we do? <laughs> and it's because I happen to be the physical embodiment mm -hmm. of that. But the work is so much bigger than that. Totally. And I think one of the things that um, people like Stacey Abrams and others remind us of is like, y'all don't understand. Black women are trying to, we are trying, we're fighting for our own liberation mm -hmm. and freedom. We, in order for us to do that, we got to make y'all better. Mm -hmm. You have to make you do mm -hmm. things differently. Mm -hmm. We have to make you listen. Mm -hmm. We have to pull you along. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, you know, Harriet Tubman in a way. She was like, you don't even yes. know you're not free. I'm going yes. like, let's go. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the change, so that if you look at the span of social change and a lot of these movements that were really anchored by black women, it was because we knew, I mean, this is early, this is going back to days when um, many of our ancestors were enslaved people were mm -hmm. enslaved. Black women had to know everybody's things. Mm -hmm. 
everybody's mm -hmm. with, uh, with within seconds they had to be able to read the energy in the room mm -hmm. know what this person wants know what mm -hmm. that person wants. they had to tend mm -hmm. to everybody. everybody's yep. needs that type of intelligence that type of being able to assess a situation mm -hmm. that type of okay got it this is where we're going leadership mm -hmm. like all of that stuff happened mm -hmm. and we today i feel like i know i do certainly feel we talked about ancestors a little bit earlier i feel that I get to pull on that reservoir totally. of, of, you know, innate knowledge totally. um, that a lot of other people don't. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. not just, it, we are not doing it just for this small little Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. We are doing it for the bigger cause. Absolutely. And we're not victimized by the burden of it. But we've taken that and we've used it as a tool in our, in our own arsenal that allows for us to achieve what we say that we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And and I find that so empowering. I really do. I have enjoyed, <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And I've learned so much about you. And it makes sense. Like, just in, in seeing you out front and, and um, the results of your leadership, it makes sense how you achieve that. It's, it's very, it comes through very clear and very oh, natural. thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us uh, for the podcast. How can folks connect with CFW? How can they connect with you? Absolutely. It's very easy. We're one of the shortest uh, uh, <laughs> domain names, I think. <laughs> CFW.org. Mm -hmm. uh, information about Willie's Warriors, information, uh, information about She Covery. If you're interested in serving on a board, um, all of our information is there. My information is there. You can reach out to me. But as I said, when we started, um, Southside Girl 312 on Twitter and mm -hmm. on Instagram. And so people can uh, reach out and connect to me there as well. Awesome. Thank you again for being here. And thank you for watching the Public Narrative Podcast with Jamira Alexander.